Sorry, we're starting right on time. Um, welcome everybody to the first Freedom Project Author Meets Critic session for the fall semester. Many of you have heard about the Freedom Project. Many of you are involved in our events, and there are those who I want to say, who have not heard much about us, and I'd like to say a few brief words as a director about what I see as the goals of the project. The Freedom Project is grounded in the idea that pluralism in a free marketplace of ideas is the very lifeblood of intellectual life and liberal arts education. What this means, since everyone does not agree about everything, imagine what kind of horrible, boring world it would be if everybody agreed on everything, is that the Freedom Project necessarily and by design is about being contentious and allowing for the maximum level of freedom of expression on the Wells and College campus. The Freedom Project is devoted to promoting intellectual diversity and pluralism on campus, and yes, providing a space at Wells where people can engage in contentious debates on some of the most pressing issues of the day. For many people, such debates make them feel uncomfortable or offended, and that is where it is left. The mind closes and we get trapped in the emotional consequences of an argument rather than through courage and fortitude, facing our discomfort, engaging with ideas that trouble us, and opening our mind to the use of reason. A dynamic, expansive, open, and free society necessitates having an open mind. A closed mind is an empty mind. I want to offer a brief quote from the distinguished writer Leon Weasel here, who has written for the distinguished magazine, The New Republic, for decades. Weasel Tale notes, an aversion to controversy is an aversion to democracy. Since all the views do not go together, and since the stakes and the validity of the respective views are very high, a free people should be a quarrelsome people. The quarrels of an open society are evidence of extraordinary philosophical and political development. They are the proof of our progress. The quarrels are not the problem, they are the solution. With that thought in mind, I would like to introduce our speakers today for our Author Meets Critics session. Mr. Jason Riley has been a distinguished member of the Wall Street Journal staff for 20 years and was appointed a member of the editorial board of the journal in 2005. <clears throat> you should speak today as actually an op-ed in the journal. You should like to look at it and can read about what's on his mind, besides what he's going to talk about today. He's an extensive commentator, both in the journal and other publications, and on television programs across the political spectrum. He's the author of the book, Please Stop Helping Us, How the Liberals Are Making It Hard for Blacks, Harder for Blacks to Succeed, which is now entering its fourth printing. Our critic today is our own Professor Michael Jeffries, Associate Professor of American Studies, who is an expert on the sociology of race and ethnicity, identity and politics, and popular culture. He's a world authority on hip hop music with his award-winning book, Thug Life, Race, Gender, and the Meaning of Hip Hop, his most recent book, Painting the White House Black, Barack Obama, and the Meaning of Race in America is one of the most powerful and definitive works on pre President Obama, one that will be a standard reference point for all future scholars who will seek to understand the phenomenon of Barack Obama. Thank you both so much for coming today. My role is very simply as a timekeeper and moderator during the question and answer period. I remind everyone that during that period there are many people here, uh, so and the topics are contentious, so when you're called on, please try to be brief and to the point and raise a question to the speaker so that all might have a chance to participate. Each member of the audience, in, in, all, in fairness to all, will be limited to one question. Each speaker will have 20 minutes each to speak, and then each speaker will respond for 10 minutes, then we will open the floor for questions. And I'll start with Mr. Black. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cushman, for that introduction, and uh, thank you, Professor Jeffries, for taking the time to participate in this this evening. Um, Thomas Sowell, uh, a black economist at Stanford, and one of the people I dedicated my book to, uh, once said that some books you write for pleasure and other books you write out of a sense of duty, because there are things that need to be said and other people who have better sense than to say them out loud. Um, this book, for me, falls into that latter category. When I started out as a journalist uh, 20 years ago, I really had no expectation of writing about race per se, and I've written on any number of subjects uh, over the years. My first book was about immigration, 
And uh, I picked the easy topics, race and immigration, the ones that bring us together as a country. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, people like Thomas Sowell and Shelby Steele and Walter Williams and a few others, to my mind at least, had already said what needed to be said and had been saying it for decades and saying it more eloquently than I ever thought I could. Um, but over the years, and with some prodding from those guys, it occurred to me that not enough young black writers were following in their footsteps and coming at this topic from a different perspective than you typically get uh, from the black left. It also occurred to me that many of the liberal solutions to black problems were just as wrong and headed as they had ever been. The fight wasn't over by any means, and a new generation of black thinkers needed to continue making these arguments for a new generation of black readers. The result is this book, which I hope will add another voice, and again, an alternative perspective to these debates, and hopefully in a way that brings more light and heat to an often emotional discussion. The book is not an autobiography or a memoir, but I do include some personal anecdotes about growing up black and male in the inner city. And one of those stories involves a trip back home to Buffalo, New York, where I was born and raised. And I was visiting my older sister shortly after I started at the Wall Street Journal. And I was chatting with her daughter, my, my niece, who was maybe in the second grade or so at the time. I was asking her about school and her favorite subjects and that sort of thing. When she stopped me mid-sentence and said, Uncle Jason, why do you talk white? And then she turned to her old friend who was there and said, don't my uncle sound white? Why are you trying to sound so smart? Now she was just teasing, of course. And I smiled and they enjoyed a little chuckle at my expense. But what she said stayed with me. I couldn't help thinking here were two young black girls, eight or nine years old, already linking speech patterns to race and intelligence. They already had a rather sophisticated awareness that as blacks, white sounding speech was not only to be avoided in their own speech, but mocked in the speech of others. Now, I shouldn't have been too surprised by this, and I wasn't. My siblings, along with countless other friends and relatives, teased me the same way when I was growing up. What I had forgotten is just how early these attitudes take hold, just how soon this counterproductive black behavior begins. I spent a lot of time in the book talking about black culture, about the problems of black culture, and about how politicians, the policymakers, and intellectuals do blacks no favors when they make excuses for black cultural defects instead of denouncing them. Blacks ultimately must help themselves. They must develop the same attitudes and behaviors and habits that other groups had to develop to rise in America. And to the extent that a social policy or a government program however well-intentioned, interferes with this self-development, does more harm than good. New York City has the largest school system in America, and 80% of black kids in New York City public schools, 80% are performing below grade level. And a big part of the problem is a black subculture that rejects attitudes and behaviors that are conducive to academic success. Black kids read half as many books and watch twice as much television as their white peers. In other words, a big part of the problem is a culture that produces little black girls and boys who are already worried about acting and sounding white by the time they are in second grade. In his writings about traveling in the antebellum South, Frederick Law Olmsted, landscape architect and designer of New York City Central Park, tells a story about a black man who was whipped while caught running a school for slaves, which was illegal in some states. In fact, it was illegal in some states even for free blacks to go to school. But that's what blacks would risk to get an education back then. That's how much they valued learning. How sad and ironic that black kids today think an education is acting white. Earlier this year, I was asked to talk about the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education which 60 years ago declared racial segregation in public schools unconstitutional. And I talked about what happened to Bill Cosby 10 years ago on the 50th anniversary of Brown. The NAACP had invited Cosby to do a speech marking the occasion, and he used his address to talk about black culture 
in the wake of Brown. He said that blacks today are squandering the gains of the civil rights movement and that white racism is not to blame. He talked about single parent families, fathers abandoning children, black criminality, attitudes towards school and so forth. We can't keep blaming whites, he said. This is no longer white people's problem. He talked about all the black pioneers who broke down barriers, marched, got spit on, punched in the face, sometimes even killed. Yet when you look at the culture of the black underclass today, Cosby said, you see no appreciation for these sacrifices. He said, what the hell good is Brown versus the Board of Education if nobody wants it? Now Cosby got a standing ovation that day. But in the weeks following his speech, he got slammed by black intellectuals who want to continue blaming whites for these bad outcomes. They said Cosby was a wealthy man who was blaming the poor for their circumstances. They said he was ignoring systemic racism. <coughs> they called him an elitist. But Cosby had the facts on his side when he said that it was a cop-out to blame whites, and white racism in particular, for the breakdown of the black family and all the subsequent cultural problems that we see in the ghetto today. Cosby was raised in Philadelphia, where he was born in 1937. Did you know that as far back as 1880, 75% of black families in Philadelphia were comprised of two parents and children, versus only 73% of white families. By 2007, however, the number would be 68% for whites, but only 34% for blacks. Was there less racism in America 15 years after the Civil War ended than there was a year before Obama was elected president? And Philadelphia was no outlier. In every census taken between 1890 and 1940, the black marriage rate in America exceeded the white marriage rate. So in a time of open, rampant racism in America, the black family was in much better shape than it is today. The black incarceration rate was lower than it is today. The black labor force participation rate was higher than it is today. And speaking of Obama, since becoming president, he has spoken on a number of occasions about the breakdown of the black family and its larger consequences. Last year, he spoke at Morehouse, the black college in Atlanta. And he said, I was raised by a heroic single mother and wonderful grandparents who made incredible sacrifices for me. But I still wish I had a father who was not only present, but involved. And so my whole life, I've tried to be for Michelle and my girls what my father wasn't for my mother and me. I've tried to be a better father a better husband, a better man. He told the black men in that audience to be good role models for other, less fortunate black men. He said that the brothers who have been left behind, who haven't had the same opportunities we've had, they need to hear from us. We need to be in the barbershops with them, at church with them, helping to pull them up, exposing them to new opportunities. We have to teach them what it means to be a man. Now that might sound like common sense to you and me. But like Cosby, Obama gets slammed by the black left when he talks like this. Because he's seen as criticizing black culture and letting whites off the hook. But again, Obama has the facts on his side. Today, for example, about 33% of children in America live with their mother, but not their father. Among blacks, however, it's 64%. For decades, studies have shown that the likelihood of teen pregnancy, drug abuse, dropping out of school, and many bad social outcomes increase dramatically when fathers are not around. One of the most comprehensive studies ever done about this concluded that black boys without a father were 68% more likely to be incarcerated than those with a father. The study said that overall the most critical factor affecting the prospect that a male youth will encounter the criminal justice system is the presence of the father in the home. All other factors, including family income, are much less important. It's been nearly a half century since President Johnson's address at Howard University, his 1965 speech. Johnson had just signed the Civil Rights Act a year earlier, and he would sign the Voting Rights <coughs> Act just two months later. And he used the speech to talk about what the government should do next on behalf of blacks. 
This was merely the end of the beginning, he said, quoting Churchill. Then he said, that beginning is freedom, and the barriers to that freedom are tumbling down. Freedom is the right to share, share fully and equally in American society, to vote, to hold a job, to enter a public space, to go to school, said Johnson. But freedom is not enough, he added. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bring him up to the starting line of a race, and then say, you are free to compete with all the others, and still believe that you have been completely fair. Johnson said the next and more profound stage for the battle of the battle for civil rights was not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. But what if Johnson was mistaken? What if there are limits to what government can do beyond removing barriers to freedom? What if the best that we can hope for from our elected officials are policies that promote equal opportunity? What if public policymakers risk creating more problems and more barriers to progress when the goal is equal outcomes? The civil rights struggles of the mid 20th century, to my mind, were liberalism at its best. These efforts culminated in the 64 and 65 acts which outlawed racial discrimination in employment and education and ensured the ability of blacks to register and vote. All Americans can be proud of these accomplishments. But what about the social policy and thinking that arose from the ruins of Jim Crow? Good intentions aside, which efforts have facilitated black advancement and which efforts have impeded it? In 1988, right around the 25th anniversary of the Great Society, Nathan Glazer, the Harvard sociologist, published a book titled The Limits of Social Policy. Glazer was analyzing the program from the perspective of someone who believed that government action was the best way to improve the lot of blacks. But his research and his assessment humbled him. He said that government programs aren't the solution to many of these problems facing the black underclass. He said that in many ways, the Great Society programs are causing just as many problems as they were solving. He said good intentions aren't enough. But unlike Nathan Glazer, many policymakers today are still riding high on those good intentions. They don't seem particularly interested in reconsidering what has been tried, even though 50 years into the war on poverty, the picture is not pretty. While gains have been made, significant disparities, racial disparities remain in some areas and black retrogression has occurred in others. The black-white poverty gap has widened over the past decade, and the black poverty rate is no longer falling. The black-white disparity in incarceration rates today is wider than it was in 1960. And the black unemployment rate has been, on average, double that of whites for 50 years. Confronted with these statistics, liberals continue to push for the same solutions that clearly haven't worked. Earlier this year, President Obama announced yet another federal initiative aimed at helping blacks. He called for more preschool education, even though studies, including those released by his own administration, have shown no significant impacts in education from such programs. He said he wants to increase reading proficiency and graduation rates for minority students, yet he opposes school voucher programs that are doing both. He calls for more of the same job training programs that study after study after study have shown to be ineffective. For the president and many on the left who think like him, empirical data seem to take a back seat to good intentions. Fred Siegel, another academic at the Manhattan Institute in New York, who's written extensively about this liberal flight from evidence and empiricism, says that it began in the 1960s. The political left, wrapped by guilt, over America's diabolical treatment of blacks, decided to hold them to different standards of behavior. Blacks were invited to enter the larger society on their own terms, said C. Discipline is a prerequisite for adult success. It was displaced by the authentic self-expression of the ill-educated. Blacks were not culturally deprived, but simply differently able, more spontaneous and expressive, and so forth. Liberals tried to improve conditions for blacks 
without passing judgment on antisocial black culture. And this sort of thinking continues to this day. The black economist Walter Williams once wrote that he's glad he grew up in the 1940s and 50s before it became fashionable for white people to like black people. He says he received a more honest assessment of his strengths and weaknesses than black kids today are likely to receive from white teachers or white employers who are more interested in being politically correct. After George Zimmerman was acquitted in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, President Obama explained the black response in the verdict this way. They understand, said the president, referring to blacks, that some of the violence that takes place in poor black neighborhoods around the country is born out of a very violent past in this country, and that poverty and dysfunction that we see in these communities can be traced to a very difficult time. In other words, Obama was doing exactly what the left has been conditioning blacks to do since the 1960s, which is to blame black pathology on the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. But ultimately, this is a dodge. Those legacies are not holding down blacks half as much as the legacy of efforts to help them. The left's sentimental support has turned underprivileged blacks into playthings for intellectuals and politicians who care much more about clearing their conscience or winning votes than in advocating behaviors and attitudes that have allowed other groups in America to get ahead. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement has become an industry that does little more than monetize this white guilt. Martin Luther King and his contemporaries demanded black self-improvement despite the abundant and overt racism of their day. Yet King's self-styled successors, living in an era when public policy bends over backwards to accommodate blacks, nevertheless insist that blacks cannot be held responsible for their plight so long as someone, somewhere in America, is still using the N-word. But the more fundamental problem with these well-meaning liberal efforts is that they have succeeded tragically in convincing blacks to see themselves first and foremost as victims. There is no greater impediment to black advancement than the self-pitying mindset that permeates the black subculture. White liberals think they are helping blacks by romanticizing bad behavior, and black liberals are all too happy to hustle guilty whites. The result is an obsession with racial slights, real or imagined. I know I'm short on time here, so just let, let me conclude that by noting that this, this concept of self-help and self-development is something that black leaders in this country understood all too well at one time. And at a time when blacks faced <coughs> infinitely more obstacles than they face today. Frederick Douglass said in 1865, that everybody had asked him and other abolitionists, what should we do with the Negro? He said, I've had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us. If the apples will not remain on the tree of their own strength, let them fall. And if the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall also. All I ask is give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Douglas was essentially saying, Give blacks equal opportunity and then leave us alone. Booker T. Washington, another black leader at the end of the 19th century, who, like Douglas, was born a slave, once said that it is important and right that all privileges of the law be ours, but it is vastly more important that we be prepared for the exercise of these privileges. Douglas and Washington did not play down the need of the government to ensure equal rights for blacks and both were optimistic that blacks would get equal rights eventually, although neither man lived to see the day. But both men also understood the limits of government benevolence. Blacks would have to ready themselves to meet the far bigger challenge of being in a position to take advantage of opportunities once equal rights had been secured. The history of 1960s liberal social policies was largely a history of ignoring this wisdom.
hear me? Yes. Yeah? Thanks. Um, I want to thank Professor Cushman and Mr. Riley for making this happen. I want to thank each of you for showing up. Um, I'm really glad that Mr. Riley cares about this. We don't agree on much of what he's written in his book, but um, it's vital that we continue these conversations because there are plenty of people in this country who simply do not care what happens to black Americans, politically, socially, existentially. So this is a good starting point, I think. I'm gonna go through the book um, <coughs> roughly in the order that it's that it's written, stopping on a couple of key points. I'll close with a more thorough critique of the kind of picture of reality that I think Mr. Riley paints and his approach to analyzing racism. And my presentation is going to be a little bit heavy on evidence, and I'm going to give some citations and names of people so that you all can go out and read them. You can jot them down as I'm kind of going along, follow my, my line of reasoning. I, I think Mr. Riley starts with a couple of key points, and we heard them restated. But the first is that. Uh, we're living through a period where the political left has what he calls a, a track record of serial altruism toward blacks. And it's failed. It hasn't worked. And, and I would take issue with that right off the bat. I don't think the track record of the right or the left has been especially charitable or altruistic toward black folks. Small, small point, but if you just look at the Clinton administration and the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1964, which earmarked $30.2 billion for crime control and the continuation of the war on drugs, liberals' hands are not at all clean when it comes to keeping the machinery of institutional racism directed toward black Americans going. Second, and relatedly, and I think this is probably the larger point, it's not just that liberal policies haven't worked, but more importantly, they've contributed to a pathological black culture that is the real culprit for blacks lagging behind whites. Riley makes this point again, and we just heard him say it here, that, quote, there is no greater impediment to black advancement than the self-pitying mindset that permeates black culture, end quote. I reject this idea uh, completely, so I'll start, I'll start uh, at the beginning. In the first chapter, one of the things that Mr. Riley does is he compares the success and the relative socioeconomic standing of black Americans to Asian Americans. We've heard this sort of model minority comparison before. And the logic goes that if racism exists, Asian Americans have sort of confident and able to persevere and lift themselves up. Why is it that black folks can't mirror those achievements? And the explanation given is that black culture is deficient, Asian American culture is uh, productive and honorable and so on and so forth. But there are quite a few things wrong with this comparison and this line of thinking. First, as ta Coates and sociologists William Julius Wilson and Patrick Sharkey recently point out, uh, there is simply no comparison between contemporary black American poverty and white poverty, Asian poverty, even Hispanic American poverty. It's truly poverty of a different kind, with an intense overlay of racial and class-based segregation that has absolutely no parallel in the late 20th and 21st century. So making these comparisons across groups is simply inappropriate. Sharkey points out in his study of children from 1955 to 1970 that 4% of whites, but 62% of blacks across America have been raised in poor neighborhoods, and a generation later those numbers are unchanged. The Pew Research Center estimates that white households are worth roughly 20 times as much as black households, and we're talking about wealth here, not yearly income. And that whereas only 15% of whites have zero or negative wealth, more than one third of blacks do. I'll say that again. 15% of whites have zero or negative wealth, one third black Americans do. Now what this means, these aren't just numbers. What this means is that when financial and economic, economic calamities strike, there is absolutely no safety net, <coughs> financial or economically speaking, for black families. If there's a medical emergency, divorce, a job loss, a massive recession caused by fraudulent lending policies. Thanks. Black families are completely unable to protect themselves and insulate themselves from those sorts of catastrophes. Second point, 
on the model minority myth. Um, it's just sort of, it's bad reasoning when we do these kinds of comparisons between uh, non-white racial and ethnic groups. In particular, the case of Asian Americans, it's quite troubling because we know how much immigration patterns have changed since 1965 in the passage of immigration reform. And we understand that folks who have come over from Asia, and not all Asian groups, right, in particular groups like uh, Cambodians, people who are of uh, Hmong descent, people from Laos, those folks don't come over with socioeconomic advantages, but many other East Asian families come over with a great deal of cultural and economic capital that they're able to leverage and pass on to their children. So they're working with a set of capital and resources that black Americans just don't have. Their starting point is fundamentally different from the average African American. Another problem with this sort of comparison, and I think it's especially uh, troubling, is that it erases the experiences and the diversity that are contained within the kind of Asian American groups. So when we hold up Asian culture as this monolith, we erase all the suffering and diversity and different uh, social experiences of all the different ethnic groups within that category. There is no monolithic Asian culture, nor is there a monolithic black culture. Those are some of the issues I have with that particular point. I want to move on to this discussion of acting white. I'm, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Riley brought it up and, and spoke about it so personally and honestly. I think it's something that many of us who are black who find themselves in these sorts of spaces uh, share similar uh, anecdotes and experiences. And to dismiss them as somehow irrelevant to the experiences of black people is simply irresponsible. However, as trying and uh, annoying as some of these experiences may be, they do not explain massive group differences in achievement when we're talking about racial disparities. Mr. Riley cites Agbu's seminal 1978 study on acting white as the foundation for much of his sort of argument about this, right? And the logic goes that these sanctions in the black community, these penalties, these social penalties that we pay, for celebrating education and talking white are so severe uh, that they just kind of discourage us from continuing to pursue that line of socialization. But there has been much work on this topic since Agu's 1978 study, in particular the work of Prudence Carter and most recently Angel Harris. And I'll focus on Angel's uh, most recent book called Kids Don't Want to Fail, Oppositional Culture and the Black-White Achievement Gap. The first thing that Harris points out here is that Black students receive no greater social cost for school performance than whites. He cites a number of studies that show that just as black kids are teased for acting white, white kids are teased for being nerds or dweebs or band dorks or etc, etc, etc. These kinds of experiences are quite common. The penalties, socially speaking, are the same. This is not the difference for uh, an achievement between the groups. So, so what are the reasons? If it's not just that, that kind of reason, what could it be? Could it be social class? Yes, Harris says, that's, that's a big piece of it. He says if you look at the data, that accounts for about one-third of the disparity. But he also says that race remains a factor. How precisely does race operate? If it's not about this kind, these kind of cultural scripts and the penalties within the black community, what is the work that race is doing here? Harris says that school personnel respond to children based on perceptions of race and gender and use these concepts as a basis for specific patterns of regulation. In other words, schools are racialized spaces. Specifically, studies find that white and Asian American children are viewed as non-threatening by teachers and administrators, while black and Latino Latina children are considered dangerous and therefore face constant surveillance and greater discipline for behavioral infractions. The interesting thing about this is that these results have also been found in predominantly black schools with predominantly black faculty and staff. This bias and disproportionate penalization of blackness and brownness is the driving factor in the so-called achievement gap, which we might rightly call the pedagogy gap. Kids who are suspended or expelled from school are more likely to drop out. Those dropouts are more likely to end up with criminal records. In many cases, school discipline pushes kids directly into the criminal justice, excuse me, the criminal punishment system. 
The U.S. Department of Education studied these disciplinary practices, <coughs> and according to the report, black children make up 18% of preschoolers, but nearly half of all out-of-school suspensions for four-year-olds. So this process of socialization, discipline, and penalty begins at age four for black kids. Riley also raises the question, well, if it's, the problem is racism, how then do we explain why black immigrants do better than African Americans, right? And there must then be something about uh, African American culture specifically as well as that, because it can't be racism because black immigrants are doing so well. But again, we've got social science research that explains and answers this question. For example, Pamela Bennett from Johns Hopkins University says, quote, when we compare immigrant blacks to African Americans from similar socioeconomic backgrounds, we find no significant differences between them and their chances of attending college. She also says, the overall differences we observe are due to differences in their family resources, not because immigrant blacks are outperforming African Americans without the benefit of any kind of added advantage. That's one piece. And the second piece is, Camille Charles, sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania, had found that uh, black immigrant students are perceived as smarter and less hostile and easier to get along with than African American students. So within the group that we label as kind of black students, there are differentiations being made. We know this intuitively, it happens all the time. There are differentiations, differentiations made in terms of stereotyping and perception based on gender, based on skin tone, based on dress, based on speech style. So this isn't a, a new concept, but that's really what's going on here. These kids are perceived and marked differently in school settings. The next topic I think is worth addressing in some detail is the black crime problem. Mr. Riley takes great issue with Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And one of the strongest arguments or loudest arguments he makes is that the liberals like Alexander basically gloss over the fact that black men commit more crimes. And it's the fact of black crime that drives mass incarceration and justifies racist stereotyping. I'm going to draw on the work of uh, Bruce Western here, who directly addresses the question of crime rates before moving to a broader discussion of actual causes. And Western says that, you know, in the 1980s, he says that about 80% of the 7 to 1 racial disparity in imprisonment was due to racial disparities in crime. So there was something to this narrative earlier on, in the early 80s, before the war on drugs. But as time has moved on, in 2008, the actual disparity in crimes committed only accounts for 40% of the disparity. So, yes, 40% of the disparity. So we're still dealing with a whole bunch of other reasons that need to be explained. Western analyzes crime rates and finds that the rising prison populations did reduce crime, but not by much. The growth in state imprisonment only reduces crime by about 2 to 5 percent. So as a policy, if we're supposed to be dealing with the crime problem, building more prisons and filling them with people is not the way to do it. So what's the root cause of this? I think we need to look no further than the war on drugs that began formally in 1982 under the Reagan administration. <clears throat> in 1980, only 1% of all prison admissions were parole violators. By the year 2000, 35% of all prison admissions were parole violators. And starting in 1980, we started scooping up massive amounts, just an unconscionable group of low-level nonviolent offenders, and drug offenders and putting them in the system. And once you get there, once you are labeled as a felon, it becomes legal to discriminate against you if you're applying for a job, you lose all sorts of political rights, your chance of recidivism skyrockets because there are no programs for re-entry into society. All of these things start to kick in in the early 80s. <coughs> From 79 to 89, the percentage of African Americans arrested for drug offenses almost doubled from 22% to 42%. During that same period, the total number of African American arrests for drug abuse violations skyrocketed from 112,000 to 450,000, an increase of over 
These arrest rates are not driven by disparities in drug use in the population. Several published reports confirm that whites use drugs at higher rates than blacks. Among those arrested, the ACLU found giant racial disparities. Black and white Americans use marijuana at a similar rate. Blacks are arrested at a rate that is 3.75 times the arrest rate for white Americans. That's, that's a small example. Alexander then just addresses the argument that what we're dealing with is not these kind of low-level drug offenses that are driving the prison boom, but really violent crime is what this is about. That's the justification then for building prisons. And she says that that doesn't work either. Violent crime has fluctuated. But incarceration rates have not reflected those fluctuations in violent crime. They are completely divorced from what's actually going on on the ground. On one side, the crime rates themselves, violent crime rates, are going like this. But the prison rate just continues like this. They are not at all tied together. The prison rate is completely and totally politically driven. And again, uninterrupted by Democrats once Clinton took office. He continues the program and the track that Reagan and Bush established. So if we have all this data at our disposal, we know that uh, black violent crime isn't the real problem, it's not what's driving the story. We know that black drug use isn't what's driving the story. What is driving the story? Why are we so afraid of black criminals and black crime? Why do we respond so harshly? harshly? The answer is quite obvious, because of racist beliefs about black people. Catherine Russell notes that at the time she wrote her book, The Color of Crime, the LexisNexis database listed roughly 50 articles generated from a white crime search. The search for black crime generated a list of over a thousand results. The discourse of crime is linked to race in the most widely accessible forms of media that we have. In their landmark study of American media called The Black Image and the White Mind, Edmund and Rejecki find that in contrast to whites, Black criminals are rarely identified by name on local newscasts, which solidifies their image as a single, undifferentiated group of offenders. Whites are drastically overrepresented as victims of crime on these same newscasts. Black people are shown in physical custody far more often than whites, and black criminals appear in jail clothing or street clothing more frequently as well. In addition, these newscasts consistently <coughs> code black figures as criminally inclined, and omit stories documenting racial discrimination and other causes of black poverty, which abets white denial of racism and inhibits political programs designed to destroy racial inequality. So we've got a discourse of crime and panic around the danger of the black criminal that drives public fear about the crime problem and seems to justify these policies that do nothing other than scoop up many folks who shouldn't at all be in the system and prevent them from re-entering and becoming reattached to more legitimate forms of employment and economic activity. Not very much time left, so let me move on. <coughs> okay. Here's what I would say is a sort of concluding thought. And there are other things worth talking about here. Affirmative action, I think, is an important discussion to have. Ghetto pathology and the culture of urban neighborhoods, I think, is an important discussion to have. But one thing I would urge us all to continue to consider when we're thinking about these kinds of problems is the continued impact of white supremacy and the plunder of black labor and wealth. ta Coates is particularly adept at describing these dynamics in the realm of home ownership in his recent piece, The Case of Reparations in the Atlantic, where he points out that while blacks did manage, by dint of perseverance, an extraordinary effort to accumulate 15 million acres of land by the early 20th century, it was appropriated by whites via terrorism, theft, and fraud. By the close of the 20th century, they owned only 1 million of the 15 million they possessed earlier. Practices of legal segregation limited the location and the value of homes that blacks might purchase, and discriminatory practices in the banking sector exacerbated this racial segregation. Coase does not even emphasize the recent financial crisis, uh, which saw Wachovia, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and several smaller banks convicted of racial discrimination in their lending practices. So these are not historical holdovers from previous eras. 
These are continued institutional racism, practices of institutional racism that affect black Americans. Second, doing the right things does not translate into equal status for blacks in the United States. Blacks who have, contrived, who have completed high school and have acquired some college education have a higher unemployment rate than whites who have never finished high school. Sociologist Diva Prager reveals that white men with a criminal record have a greater likelihood of being called back for jobs than black men with no, with, with, sorry, white men with a criminal record have a, have a greater likelihood of being called back for jobs than black men with no record at all. Right. Finally, just in kind of a general sort of worldview point, the, the sort of stereotypes that exist today are basically unchanged from those that were used to justify every preceding ethic of white supremacy in this country. The stereotype of the black thug, criminal, rapist, the exotic, hypersexual black woman, the welfare mother, these kinds of things are being recycled over and over again. Yet the argument in this book seems to be that they are somehow true and deserved today, despite the fact that we know our history and the reasons for their continued circulation are unchanged. The reasons are the privileging of white people and the protection of white patriarchy at the expense of black people, people of color more broadly, and all people at deviant gender locations. These ideologies exist with a specific purpose, to justify the economic system in place. Today, poor and working class black labor is essentially useless. There is no place for these workers within our society, so they must be physically displaced, socially isolated, and morally condemned for sins that amount to little more than being black in America. And I hope we'll have time to address some of the other issues in the book. Thanks. Thank you. 
and in some of our inner cities, it's as high as 80 or 90 percent. Another discussion was about black criminality or crime in general. And I'll make a, a couple points on that. The war on drugs. I've already stated that the black crime rate was lower in the 1960s. So is the war on drugs to blame for these incarceration rates that we see? And I don't think the evidence shows that. Blacks are about 13% of the population, but they're about 37% of the prison population. And I'm talking about the state prison population, which houses the overwhelming majority of inmates in our system, more than 80%. 13% of the population, about 37% of the prison population. If you could snap your fingers and send everyone home in prison who's there for a drug offense, blacks would still be about 37% of the prison population. Drug offenses are not driving the black incarceration rate. Violent offenses are driving the black incarceration rate. By a long shot, it's not even close. Blacks, again, are 13% of the population, but responsible for about half of all murders in America. Blacks are arrested for violent crimes at two to three times their numbers in the population. For property crimes at two to three times their numbers in the population. For white collar crimes, two to three times their numbers in the population. We talk about black incarceration as people are just being plopped off, off the street and thrown into jail. You will search in vain through Michelle Alexander's book for data on black crime rates. It's all about black incarceration rates. We talk about school suspension rates. <coughs> Why would you expect racial parity in school suspension rates? Do you see racial parity in disciplinary outcomes when the kids leave school? Do you think this all starts after high school graduation? Why would you even expect to see racial parity in disciplinary rates? Yes, blacks are suspended at higher rates than whites. And whites are suspended at higher rates than Asians. Are the suspension policies anti-white? Yes, blacks receive loans from banks at lower rates than whites. And whites receive them at lower rates than Asians. By the way, blacks also receive them at lower rates than whites from black lenders. What is their racial animus? These schools where the kids are being suspended Many of the administrators and the principals and the teachers are white, or I'm sorry, are black themselves. What is their racial animus in picking on the black kids? Making excuses for black, bad black behavior does not help blacks. Are we, let's see if there was something else. Five more minutes. Whenever we get a Trayvon Martin or a Ferguson, uh, we start having these conversations about race. But I don't think we're often having the right conversation. It's not about whether police value black lives or America values black lives. It's about black criminality in these neighborhoods. The police are there because that is where 9-11 calls originate. The law-abiding members of these communities call the police to come and protect these neighborhoods. And the sad part is that the cops are there, for the most part, preventing blacks from shooting one another. It's not that hard to avoid getting shot by a cop. Trust me, it really isn't. It's much more difficult for these kids in these ghettos to avoid getting shot by other black people. Our morgues and prisons are not full of young black men. Our morgues and cemeteries, I should say, are not full of young black men because cops are shooting them. It's because other black people are shooting them. Blacks are not only committing half of all murders in the country, 
90% of their bed shooting victims are other black people. This whole debate over cops, tensions between cops and the black community, racial profiling, these are effects, not causes. So long as black criminality is what it is, you are going to have tensions between cops and the black community. Young black men are going to be viewed suspiciously, so long as the crime rates bear out those suspicions. If we want to do something about those tensions, if we want to do something about those perceptions, we need to do something about the behavior driving those perceptions. And that is not typically the conversation we have when Ferguson goes down. It becomes about poverty, or unemployment, or whether cops value black lives. Do the thugs doing most of this killing value other black lives? Should blacks hold whites to higher standards than they hold other blacks when it comes to valuing black lives? These would be much more honest conversations about race of the type Eric Holder is constantly calling for. This is the discussion he wants to have. The discussion of black left wants to have is about white racism, period. Until it has been vanquished from America, that's all we should be talking about. And again, I would encourage you to look at a period of time in black history when there was much, much more racism than there is today and what was going on in black America at that time. There was not black culture or black behavior that led to black people's enslavement and systematic rape. It was not black culture or black behavior that led to lynching and terror campaigns that prevented blacks from owning businesses and homes, or medical experimentation and sterilization, as my professor, my colleague, uh, Professor Susan Rodriguez, documented. It was not black behavior that led to Jim Crow. It was not black behavior that led to the murders of unarmed black men like Trayvon Martin, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Amdou Diallo, and countless others. <clears throat> we hear so much about how black people should take personal responsibility for their pathological culture and individual behaviors and hold themselves accountable. Where is white personal responsibility and accountability? Where is the indictment, the mere indictment, of Darren Wilson for murdering Michael Brown? We have to beg and protest and sing and cry and bleed and be arrested for the mere mimicry of a justice process that tells us that a grand jury that's 75% white is going to decide the fate of something that happened in a county that's 60% black. It's an insult. Where's personal responsibility for George Zimmerman? A man who called the police for no reason, followed a black teenager with a loaded gun in a vehicle, left the vehicle after the police told him not to, and shot Trayvon Martin. I think it's worth returning in some detail to this question of whether there's less versus more racism, or whether we can measure racism, or should be talking about racism in terms of racial animus. The less versus more way of thinking about this, I think, is inappropriate. First of all, recent public opinion data has shown that white antipathy, both explicit and implicit toward black people and Hispanics, has grown during the Obama era such that greater than 50% of whites now express antipathy toward blacks, both implicitly and explicitly, in the year 2013. That's where it was taken. So and if we're talking about attitudes, that picture is not so rosy. But really, this isn't, about, this isn't about attitudes. When we're talking about racism, when I say racism is to blame, I'm talking about 
institutional racism. I'm talking about the lending policies of banks that caused the financial crisis. I'm talking about continued job discrimination, where you have these blind name studies, and people with black names receive fewer callbacks with the exact same resume as white candidates. These things are still going on today. I'm talking about the disparity in arrest and incarceration rates, which again is, you ask the question, uh, is the war on drugs to blame? And, you know, again, I, it doesn't just stop with the war on drugs. Criminal justice, criminal punishment policy since the 1980s has been sick and ineffective. State and local governments are incentivized by the federal government to increase arrests because they get more funding for uh, their departments, they get military equipment that we've seen uh, paraded around in Ferguson during these protests. There are institutional policies that continue to keep these racially disparate outcomes moving. Now, on the question of culture versus structure, I think part of what's going on here and part of what Mr. Riley may be reacting to is what seems like a complete denial of the facts on the ground. That is, there may be some people on the left who defend the circumstances and the happenings in black ghettos where there is a depacification of day-to-day -day life, where there are more violent crimes, where there are antisocial behaviors and a quote-unquote code of the street, as ethnographers have found. Those things do exist. But the question is about where they come from. And, and people on the left have an answer to this question. People like Cornel West, William Julius Wilson, have talked about culture as a structure. So what we have here is a circumstance where we're talking about an ecological view of impoverished black urban culture. This is a specific argument that talks about specific neighborhoods where concentrated poverty is a reality. A specific argument about specific neighborhoods, we're talking about the overlay of class segregation and race segregation. Not a monolithic black culture that pollutes all black people. It is locally specific, locally engendered. What's the historical story that got us there? In William Julius Wilson's book, The Truly Disadvantaged, which Mr. Riley cites, he tells that story quite thoroughly. He says, first, we have to look at the effects of historic and contemporary discrimination. Second, we have to look at migration patterns and the changing age demographics of those neighborhoods where we're seeing younger populations. Third, basic economic changes, and this is a massive part of the story that is so rarely discussed, have transformed the economy into a situation where we now have so few manufacturing jobs to basically situation where we now have service industry jobs and high-level elite kind of information management jobs. What few manufacturing jobs remain, the staple of the black middle class through much of the 20th century, have migrated outside of urban centers over the latter half of the 20th century. So when we talk about social and spatial isolation, we're talking about isolation from the kinds of jobs that used to allow black families to remain in middle class status. None of these material changes are the product of black culture. That story is backwards. The kinds of black cultural outcomes, the depacification of day-to-day -day life, the growth of the drug trade, in particular through the 80s and some of the 1990s, the code of the street in urban ghetto neighborhoods, those are effects of these broader material changes. And in solving these problems, Wilson's solution, he talks about culture quite a bit, but his solution is not, we need to change behaviors. He says, asking people to change these kinds of behaviors is like asking them to imagine a world they cannot possibly touch, see, hear. It doesn't exist to them. Their cultural toolkit is totally uh, devoid 
of the kinds of things they would need, the implements they would need to mimic what's going on in some other spatially and socially uh, constructed portion of the country. You need both race-specific policies, Wilson says, to make these changes, and they have to be complemented with job programs, housing programs, childcare subsidies, welfare programs. Things that were slashed to an unconscionable extent during the Reagan administration, and again, continued by Clinton, despite the fact that Clinton held up Wilson's book and said, this is the model we need to pursue. He then went on to slash welfare to a place where it no longer even vaguely resembles what it was intended to do. So I hope that I'm not coming across as someone who's too partisan here, blaming Republicans for all of these problems. There's been a disregard, a misunderstanding, a sort of set of political appeals that both parties share and share responsibility for this problem. I think I'll stop there. Maybe we can open up for questions. Um, just um, open questions, and I'll just uh, moderate that and enjoy it. And anybody want to start us? Thank you, gentlemen. Yes? Uh, Mr. Riley, you talk about um, violent crimes um, versus drug crimes, and that the uh, population of is uh, percentage wise higher for, me, for blacks, even in um, violent crimes. Couldn't that possibly be a result either more so or in addition to um, black culture, as you say, but also for black people being more likely to be arrested and incarcerated or er, and found guilty by a jury? What do you mean by more likely? Like couldn't that percentage be part like couldn't you say that race is not the problem, but could it racism be what's causing this? I didn't say racism is not a problem. Mm -hmm. I said using racism as an all-purpose explanation of the problem doesn't stand true. Racism still exists. That's not the question. The question is to what extent is racism an explanation for these black outcomes? And I'm saying racism cannot explain these black outcomes given the blacks have achieved the entire period. Um, there is an argument that blacks aren't committing crimes at higher rates. They're simply arrested. That is an argument. And it's one that, um, that many on the left make. One um, way to push back at that is to look at, <clears throat> you compare the rate at which blacks are arrested with the rate at which uh, victims of crimes identify blacks as their perpetrators. If this is a case of over policing, picking up blacks, those two rates would be a little out of whack. The police would be arresting blacks at far higher rates than victims would be describing the perpetrators as black. That's not the case. Those two numbers are right about the same. They have to be consistent. I'd like to bite that one. Yeah. Please, please. I, I think. Then <coughs> you can correct me if I'm. Is this on? Yes. Yes, it is on. <laughs> I think uh, I'll just kind of re-ask re your question as kind of an answer. Um, and we can, you know, we can, ex we can accept the possibility that there is a difference in, in the rate of offenders, in the rate of offenses. Possibility? Yes, we can accept that. I mean, there's a possibility that there is no difference? Sure, sure. I'm sure. I mean, not, not in terms of what's what's people get scooped up for, but we don't we don't have to dismiss that claim. So we can we can start from this, right? But I think the question was about in in explaining why that is. The explanation that you give is that there is some sort of sickness in black culture that explains that disparity. Now, I think the question was. Rather than attributing the disparity to the sickness within black culture, 
to look at it as something that is caused by a domino that falls way over here, right? And that first domino is people getting scooped up in the system at a very, very early age, which only serves to disconnect them and knock them off any legitimate paths they might have Who's for lifting them up. Other black. No, well, <laughs> you're talking about suspension rates in schools. So, I think that. First of all, the school suspension story is a perfectly legitimate argument, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure where, I mean, I think the case that we might ask school faculty and administrators to treat four-year-olds with a bit more discretion and fairness, I don't think that's an outrageous request. To suggest that when the data shows us that uh, teachers and administrators are subject to both implicit and explicit bias and stereotyping that we might ask as part of our program, part of our pedagogical mission, to push back against that seems like a morally well, sound question. Well, you can try and make four-year-olds face this problem, but they're not to face this problem. This is a middle school and high school problem of violence in schools. And I would take it a step further. Why are your sympathies with the kids who are in school acting out instead of with the kids who are in school to learn. Oh, nice. And how does <laughs> it help the kids who are in school to learn by going easy on the boys? These black kids are already relegated to the worst schools with the most inexperienced teachers. You now want to make them the most violent schools as well. How is this helping black people? Okay. So I think. I don't think this is a question of um, sympathy. I think it's a question of uh, understanding where the root causes of this problem are. The root causes of this problem are that uh, many black students attend underfunded schools with faculty and administrators who are ill-equipped to deal with, to counteract, who could be, all of the forces of structural racism that we people face on their day-to-day lives. In addition to the characteristics of the schools themselves, when they go home, they are going home to communities that, again, are ecologically distinct and different from anything else that we find in this country. They're going home to places where people do not have legitimate attachments to the labor market. They're going home to places where their siblings, family members, are already caught up in the criminal punishment system. So this is, this is where I think the root of the problem lies, rather than a kind of individual choice to uh, act out in class. And even if, that, if, if, even if that occurs, when the kid is 6, 8, 12, this form of punishment and this form of discipline is just not applied equally. It isn't. Because children's behaviors, and like I said, there are, there are variations, not only, of course, among race and suspension rates, but also <coughs> With regard to gender, girls behave better than boys. More boys are suspended than girls. Is something amiss? I mean, this, there's an assumption, and this is known as disparate impact analysis here, that when you see disparate outcomes with regard to race, or ethnicity, or gender, you can automatically assume racial animus or some sort of bias has been involved, even if it's a race-neutral policy. The very fact that you see disparate outcomes means something is wrong and something is amiss. I would take issue with that analysis right off the bat. We don't see equal outcomes, race, gender, ethnicity, in America, or outside of America. Not today, not 100 years ago, not ever. Equal outcomes of the sort that are being used as proof that something is wrong and we don't see them, have never existed anywhere. But the reason for the equal, the reason for the equal outcomes 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and so there weren't equal Sure there were. What do you mean there weren't I mean, I mean, people were not looking side by side. There was Jim Crow. There was all sorts of, there were all kinds of separate societies. I mean, to presume that, I mean, so there are two, I think there are two different things here. The first is that 
equal outcomes could ever be generated in a, something that's called a kind of neutral playing field. There has never been neutrality along lines of race or gender in this country, right? That's a problem. That's a social justice problem that is worthy of attention. A. B. <coughs> That's true, but, but the, the problem is when you make equality of outcomes not only the goal, but you then assume that where you don't see them, something's wrong. That, that there's some sort of animus involved. Because the proportion of doctors or lawyers is not equal to their racial representation in greater society, there must be some bias going on somewhere. I think that is their thing. But, but this isn't speculation. We know that bias exists. This isn't speculation about bias. It's right, this empirically is, this done. Is and this is inductive reasoning. It's because we know racism could be a cause of disparate outcomes. It's not mean everywhere we see them, it's due to racism. <laughs> that doesn't carry the argument. What does it show to? I mean, the argument is going kind of circular. What I'd like to ask you. <laughs> what I want to ask you. Yes, sir. Does the question of economics have anything? You talk about this sort of idyllic past prior to 1960. Idyllic? I would not call the 60s idyllic. I've listened to you, I just want to make a point. You can ask questions without putting words in my mouth, go ahead. I could describe, when you talk about the part of 1960, in terms of there being less racism, I would want to describe that, is that the, your, your statement, as some sort of idyllic past when things were much better with us, less racism. So, I, I mean, that's, I would just take that, 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 that liberty. But what I'd like to ask you, how does economics and the economic organization of this society functions into these outcomes? For example, we know that the rates of growth we saw in the American economy after World War II will not continue. We had 6%, 7%. We know for the next few years it will be 1% and 2%. Is there any correlation between that and the behaviors that we see? Let's just say, for example, if we see the same trajectory of economic growth that's taking place, how are blacks to change their culture to get better outcomes? Well, well, I think that speaks to what um, people like Frederick Douglass and Wilson I want to talk about it. Forget Freddie. I want to hear your position. Okay. I think I answered the question by initial remarks. I think this is what black leaders of the past were getting at when they said blacks would be ready themselves to take advantage of opportunities. They didn't quite have that then, but they were optimistic were coming, and they were. In the 1960s, blacks became a form I am form. saying that behavior oh, sounds, sounds kind like of... Sounds like so we have a discussion. You want to have a discussion? No, we have about 50 people here. That all right, all right. The, the, point, on, the talk. point is that yeah, friend, so what, what blacks can do it's, it's in terms of taking advantage of economic growth when it does come and when we do have it, or not being harmed as much during the economic slowdowns, I think they are it's, culturally related. There are public policy responses as well, but in terms of culturally related. Uh, responses is all the jobs aren't in the world are going to do something for a community that doesn't have a work ethic. All so, the best no, schools in the world aren't going to do anything for if a culture doesn't value education. <laughs> and so I think That's this whole right. acting white stuff that we were talking about, the kids who are getting beat up in school, that this pass. raising their hands, answering their questions, for knowing the answers, this whole problem of Book reading versus television watching. That's old. That's the anti-intellectualism. That's old. Is an issue. That's old. I want to get to this notion of culture and defective culture, all that kind of nonsense. I am saying to you, I'm asking you one question, you're not answering me. I'm saying that behavior and culture and outcomes are directly related to economic outcomes. 
Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe, maybe Michael could have a word when you call on somebody else. Thank you, so I, I understand your passion. I, I do. Passion. 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 Passion.
When the University of California system, back in 1996, ended race-based preferences in college admissions, black graduation rates went up. They went up by more than 50%, including <coughs> the more difficult disciplines of science and math. Again, up by 50%. So a policy that had been put in, put in place to help increase the ranks of the black middle class was in fact resulting in fewer black doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects than we otherwise would have had in the absence of these policies. And why is that? Well, years ago, black kids at MIT were in the top 10% on their math scores. Of all kids on the SAT, of all kids in the country, the top 10%. But they were in the bottom 10% of their peers at MIT. So kids who'd be hitting it out of the park at a less selective school were struggling at MIT, and therefore more than were dropping out. But MIT could care less about it. MIT was interested in what that freshman class looked like. They wanted diversity. Whether black kids were actually graduating was a secondary concern at best. But again, it was a well-intentioned policy. But I would encourage you to look at the results. What has happened? Have those good intentions resulted in what people thought they were? We get, do I, do I, do I, do I, I definitely don't want to get in the middle of all this. But, <laughs> but maybe, um, how about you in the back? You've had your hand up the whole time. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Riley, for, for coming, and um, thank, thank you, everyone, who put this on. Um, I have a speak up a little bit. It's a little bit echoey. Sorry. I'm about. I'm not that loud. Sorry. Thank you. 
Yeah, you know, from any kind of government program and and be on the same level of success automatically without providing any kind of like safety net, like like Professor Jeffers was mentioning, um, any kind of safety net, any kind of way of supporting people who are not heteronormative white people. Like, how can you expect that? These institutions are built for those people. They're built for these people, and it's not only built for that asset, it has been able to exclude people of color for years. So how how do you <laughs> I'm not defending the institution. I'm talking about what public policies have worked better in terms of helping the black women class. And non racially discriminatory policies when it comes to the black power. Yes, 
Oh, we might have to go over a little time. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Within reason, by the way. You argue that it would make more sense for the students to go to institutions that are better suited for their capabilities, which we are therefore assuming are lower than the white students who usually go to an institution. No, you're assuming that. I'm not. The population show. that seems to succeed seems to be a population that is racially biased towards white middle class students. Or no, say that again. Um, the kind of population that ends up succeeding and not dropping out of those schools um, that do have the experiment action policy. So that's where you can like give an example. The ones I managed to graduate, to graduate then with better rates seem to be white middle class students. So let's assume no, that they were no, better. That's not what I'm saying. Well, and well, you're making assumptions I'm not making. So well, let's okay. just let's be clear that they're your assumptions. I'm sorry. Okay, let's. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. Right. Don't say you're sorry. That these people are not well suited for these schools, and therefore they should go on to succeed at other institutions that are better, no. better matched to their own. That's not what I'm saying. Without a permitted action policy. Black kids at MIT who come in with test scores matching the average student at MIT do just fine, despite the microaggression. Black kids who go into MIT with lower test scores, lower G. <coughs> lower class ranks tend not to do well. If we want to increase black graduation rates, those kids should not be admitted to MIT with those lesser qualifications. Black kids who meet those qualifications <coughs> go to those schools and do fine. That's what the evidence shows. It's not about looking this as the blacks as a group. All blacks must do this, or all blacks must do that. It's about Matching kids with schools where they're likely to succeed. Well, but then we're going back to why do these kids not achieve like better? Why do they not have better SAT scores? And then because we, of the K through 12 education. And then we wonder, well, what about government programs that would help prepare these kids better to go on to these schools? Which well, well, one, one of the programs that I push for when it comes to increasing K through 12 education quality and obviating the need for racial preferences freshman year in college are sending these kids to schools that have a track record of success. Many of them are charter schools. Okay, we, Voucher we, programs also have a track record. We have about eight success. minutes left, so I, I want to call on some of you because Mr. Rye asked us to drive back to New York and we wanted to, wanted to get there too late, but I could stay here all night and there's lots of issues we can continue to talk about here in various guys. But T Tina, did you have a question? Um, I'd love to be able to call on everybody. I really would. It's a very difficult position on it. Firstly, thank you, Mr. Riley, and thank you, Mr. Jeffries, for being here in the spirit of intellectual discourse. Um, I really appreciate the contention. So remaining on the topic of education, um, I thought it was interesting that you guys both used the same example to illustrate both of your points. And so I wanted to kind of see if we could reconcile that difference. Um, so both of you referred to elementary schools and how um, teachers were more likely to view black children as a threat compared to white children, um, even with, or um, black, or okay, so teachers were more likely to view black children as a threat than white children, and this was common both among white teachers and black teachers. So in your logic of racism, which I'm a little bit unclear about, so if you could clarify, mm -hmm. you use this as an example to prove that institutionalized racism isn't a threat because if black, black teachers can also be can also discriminate against black students, then racism is not the issue here. Um, but I wanted to, or I would like to ask you to clarify if that would not be, on the other hand, a more evidence toward the fact that the institution, the racism is so institutionalized, so insidiously internalized by these teachers, black and white, and in all of society, that this is how it actually permeates the society, right? So is that example actually evidence toward your claim that racism is not an issue or that racism is such a universal issue? Well, I, I mentioned um, the uh, black makeup of administrators and teachers and principals to suggest that racial animus may not be drivers. I mean, it's, it's the same argument. You know, black cab drivers pass up young black men heading up to Harlem just like white cab drivers. So do you think black that owners of restaurants are asking black kids to prepay for their meals, just like white owners. So then the question becomes, what, how much of this can we ascribe to white racism, which is the all-purpose explanation? So if it's, if it's 
consciously animosity, then do you think it's possible that racism can be internalized by people? Do you think that structural inequalities can be internalized? Is there racism in America? Yes. That's not her question. That's not her question. I think we're having some internalizing of the racism that we're experiencing right now. Oh, self-hating black people. No, she's talking about institutionalized racism. I think, yeah, I think we're having some slippage in terms of the definition of, of racism. Sorry, I'm getting whether we can talk about racism as a psychological phenomenon, <laughs> uh, whether we can talk about racism as a psychological phenomenon, or whether it's something bigger than that, something institutional that has psychological components, but is in fact more powerful, more insidious, and more sort of far reaching than individual psychological grounds. That is I'm, 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 Again, I don't think racism has been vanquished in America. I don't think anyone in this room will live to see the day when it has been. I think blacks must succeed notwithstanding that. And there was a time in America when blacks had that attitude. Today, the attitude seems to be, until it is vanquished, don't blame us for it. Don't blame culture. Don't blame, don't blame behavior. It's white racism. And I think that's a cop-out explanation. For these, for these gaps we see in terms of social outcomes. So if you don't believe in equality of outcomes, do you believe that true equality of opportunity exists in America? Just a true equality? No, no. But there's more opportunity today than there used to be. Do you think we have a duty to create equality of opportunity between yes. white people and black people? And I think that the government in particular, there are limits to what it can do on this front. Even if the goal ultimately is equal outcomes, there are limits to what the government can do to push things in that direction. And the social engineering that they've tried for the past 50 years under the Great Society programs and the War on Poverty, I believe has not worked and that we need to reevaluate what we've been trying I want given to these outcomes and the fact that some of these disparities have actually grown. I want to make I, I want to make at least a couple of points on, on this. The, the, the first is I think one of the things that, that troubles me about this narrative is I think you've consistently pre presented it as a sort of continuous 50-year effort to push back against the effects of, continued effects of institutional racism. And my argument about the way that social policy, government policy has gone in the past few years is that we cannot understand it as an unfettered charge, an unfettered pushback against racism. That's not what we've seen. I made the point that the Reagan administration was a disaster. It was 10 steps backward. The 5465 was five steps forward. The Reagan administration was 10 steps back, and Clinton continued that. So I don't think you can just say, you know, for the past 50 years we've been pushing back against this and it hasn't worked. Because we haven't been we've pushing been, We've been years. spending money on it in large volumes for the past 50 years. Uh, sure, but there's been other forces that have inhibited that kind of progress at a, at a financial clip that far exceeds what the government spending can possibly do. So I don't understand the, the logic there. And government spending on things that are counter to it, that are counteracting it, are just as bad. Like the $30 billion that Clinton spent to reinforce the prison prison boom. So that's, that's the first thing. May I finish? Let me okay, the second point. The second point you raised is that um, there was a kind of can-do attitude that more rightly characterized black culture in eras prior to this one. Yes. And I don't think that, um, anecdotally speaking, in much of what we've heard today, that that attitude isn't there anymore. Because people like Barack Obama have talked about that sort of do-it-yourself stuff in public forums since 2004 he's been saying that kind of thing. You've talked about it today. This is kind of out there in the public discourse. I'm sure that each of us have sat with family members and friends who in closed door settings and maybe in public, and perhaps in church, these, these, these views get expressed. So it's not as if that ideology and that way of thinking has somehow disappeared from black collective yeah, consciousness. It's, it's not just, what it was. And I think that's why we have the outcome today. I need to see more compelling evidence that both quantifies that and shows me the kind of um, prevalence of that attitude relative to the forces that it's actually fighting against. Yeah, the, the other thing I want to make, you made this point several times about the Reagan administration and the 80s, the war on drugs, the drug sentencing, the prison reforms. <coughs> what they were leaving out are the black lawmakers that were at the forefront of that effort in response particularly the crack epidemic of the 1980s. The Congressional Black Caucus led the charge for a stronger drug sentencing, for the sentencing disparity. People like Charlie Rangel, 
and major were at the forefront of that fight because this drug was devastating their communities back home. To look back 30 years and go, in hindsight, oh, it was all racist. You are conveniently leaving out who was pushing this effort, this war on drug effort that is so routinely called racist today was pushed by black lawmakers in Congress. I think I've been quite clear that black people can participate in institutional racism and the Democrats and they are not are self-hating. Of course, Charlie Randall is not a self-hating black man. This is not about my perception of myself. It is about being embedded and supporting institutions that produce <laughs> racist outcomes. This is not about my perception of self. By the way, it's a about, black man runs the criminal justice system right now, reports to another black man. Of course. Of course. Four. Ellie had her hand up, and then you, man, can go after that. Okay, thanks. Hi. You can go. Um, okay. My name's Ellie. This is really interesting. And then after the second one, we have to stop because people. It, I, I hate to be in that position to stop this. You know, we can continue if you like, informally. Okay. Um, what I hear. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try and do this. If it doesn't work, I'm sorry. Okay. Awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get this across. And if it doesn't work, then I'm sorry in advance. Okay. What I hear you saying and you saying is that the culture is not to blame. It is the efforts that have been done that should drive the shift in culture, and that without those efforts, the shift in culture will simply not happen. Okay. Now what I hear you saying is that these efforts will simply not work if there is not a culture to match it. Because if there's not that culture, if, there's, if the society doesn't work, then no matter what you do, the kid's going to drop out of school. Am I right so far? No. OK. Why am I not right? I think there are policies. No, no, no. no. Why am I not right? Why is that not working right? OK. Because I don't think it's cultural at all. I think there are policies that can put in place incentives. Um, we haven't talked a lot about labor economics today, but it's a good part of my book. When I talk about the history of things like the minimum wage laws, which were passed in the 1940s by white lawmakers intending to price blacks out of the labor market. This was during the Great Migration of the South. White labor of the North was worried about these blacks coming up and taking jobs, and they got Congress to pass these minimum wage laws that they would, would price blacks out of the labor market and leave the jobs for their union members. Now, there's a policy that today I do not think is driven, raising the minimum wage is not driven by racial animus, but I think the effects are largely similar. A lot of young and experienced blacks are being priced out of the labor market. Now, there's an example of where, yeah, I can talk about a cultural work ethic and the importance of that. But the availability of jobs is also important, and policy can do something about that. Okay, we're, we're winding down. It's, it's so you're going to have the last question, and, and it's all up to you to figure it out. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much for coming. The debate is certainly not over, folks. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Jeffries and Mr. O'Reilly. Um, when you talk about personal responsibility, is which I think you're talking about, um, Mr. Mr. O'Reilly. Yes, Riley. Um, I'm glad. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, when you talk about personal responsibility, Obama and his um, My Brother's Keeper initiative talks about personal responsibility, but he still recognizes institutional racism, and he still recognizes different organizations that need to help black, black and Latino youth um, in these higher education um, and just programs in general. So I'm wondering why. Not that you and Obama's position are similar, but you do talk, you, both of you do talk about personal responsibility. I'm wondering why your position in your book totally rejects the notion of institutionalized racism when the two to, so can you expand more on that? And, because I, from what I'm hearing. My, 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 my beef with Obama and what he's done is that on the one hand, he will talk about uh, personal responsibility, as you suggested, uh, in front of black audiences. Uh, Michelle Obama's done the same thing. Um, but then he pushes policies that are like, for instance, his opposition to school choice. He pushes policies that recognize institutionalized racism and personal responsibility. No, push, pushes, he pushes policies that undermine efforts by blacks to help themselves. 
how is recognizing institutionalized racism undermining the efforts by young black youth, like some of the young black youth in here that are taking personal responsibility? I don't know anyone we've discussed tonight, anyone in this room, I'm sure Professor Jeff is, this, this, that kind of thing you're saying of people who don't recognize institutional racism and those who do. I'm saying that racism is not the biggest barrier to black progress in America. You're that saying marriage is, is the biggest I didn't barrier. Say <laughs> <laughs> you said marriage is the biggest barrier, that if black men and women decide on it. So you said your solution to the problem was marriage, did you not? I said, I said that black married couples have a single digit poverty rate in the past 20 years. So if someone wants to address black poverty in America, it seems to me it's largely a problem of single men, particularly single women who are so I, I'm so if and that's where we, so that is something if we want to discuss black poverty, that needs to be part of the discussion. And that has to do with attitudes towards marriage in the black community, attitudes towards childbearing, attitudes towards childbearing. That's gotta be part of the discussion. Well, there's the cultural angle. But there's a policy angle there as well which is open-ended welfare benefits do not encourage responsible childbearing or childbearing. Trying to replace the father in the home with the government child. You're going not back encouraged. to marriage and, and childbearing. I'm what trying to explain that, that, that it's not all about culture. It is also about policy. And while Obama might talk a good game on the cultural front, the policies he's pushing, I think, actually undermine his cultural argument. They're not helping. It's a very quick response, and I'll just reiterate something I said earlier. I, I think that, again, in 1987, in the truly disadvantaged, Wilson weighs in on this quite clearly. And he says that if you want this marriageable market problem is a direct function of the labor market. If you do not solve that labor market question first, you are never going to see those marriage rates rise. That's the first piece. And the second piece is, the second piece is, Wilson also says that you need a combination of social welfare net policies and economic stimulus policies. You cannot expect the economic policies in and of themselves to be enough to lift out this black underclass from the struggle that they're trapped in. Now, the 80s that you so despair produced more job growth, record job growth in the history of this country. The black labor participation rate for young black men in the 1980s actually fell. Well, job growth was because exploding in this country. Because as I said, the labor market was changing into a place where those manufacturing jobs were completely But it was changing secure. for everyone. What is the Why did it only affect in this way? They were the only group among which okay. men, not black women, which again gets this racism charge as well. Men, young black men, their labor participation was alone during this period of the 1980s and for every other subgroup. But because those are the jobs they were locked into. Those are the jobs that they had. You want them to suddenly become your boss? You want suddenly line in Detroit? You want them to suddenly become an ophthalmologist? It doesn't <laughs> And among black women? Yeah. It works for them. What works for them? Their labor participation rate increased. Well, those could be explained by a number of other factors, right? Like. Perhaps they were attending. But they can't by racism. <laughs> no, but, but it wasn't. It was a shift. <laughs> I never said it was about that particular point. It's not about racism. It's about the changing structure of the American labor market. This is the point that Wilson makes. Thank you very much for coming and uh, come back again.